Good evening and happy Sabbath. We're happy to have you joining us this evening as we begin to worship the Lord on this Sabbath hour, this Sabbath day. Um, God is worthy of our worship. And so I want to just begin by saying, let's welcome him into our hearts this evening. Let's welcome him to be the major influence in our life this evening. And as we enjoy the program, as we enjoy the ministry and the services tonight, keep that in mind that all of this is an opportunity for us to allow Jesus Christ to rule and to reign in our life. We're very happy to have the participants in the program. The service will go as usual. We have the, the, the normal participants, but we'll be having special music by Gigi, accompanied by Sergio. We'll have Nancy doing opening prayer, Dr. Yami doing offering appeal and sermon and benediction. Ina will give us our children's story and Mana will give us our scripture reading. We just thank you for being with us. And again, we welcome you, but we encourage you to welcome God into your life and let him rule and reign. Thank you very much.
Beyond the mortal dreams of man Where every tear will be left behind But it must be in another time Oh, there'll be an everlasting light Shining a purest hope But it must be in another place Oh, 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 oh. So I'm waiting For another time And another place Where all my hopes and dreams Will be captured with one Look at Jesus' face Hold my heart, skin buried My soul skips scaring Sometimes I can hardly wait For that sweet, sweet someday When all this swept away To another time Tired of earthly things, they promise peace but furnish pain. For all the sweetest joys combined could never match those in another time. Oh. oh, and though I put my trust in Christ and felt his Spirit move in my life. I know it's truly just a taste of His glory in another place. Oh, oh, oh. so I'm away.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to have a day of rest. Thank you for planning centuries ago this need for us. We welcome in you into our hearts, into our homes. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us, for safety, for protection. Thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come to you in prayer. Thank you for being such a wonderful Heavenly Father. Bless this program, bless all the participants, and bless all the hearers throughout the world who are listening to this program. Lord, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Help them to accept you into their hearts with an open heart and mind. Again, thank you, Lord, for Jesus who died on the cross to give us an opportunity for salvation. In Jesus' holy and precious name, and we pray, amen. Have you heard the story of the little boy who visited the church for the very first time? His neighbor had taken him, and so he was really excited. He had no idea what to expect. But when he entered, he loved the music, like what you heard Sergio and Gigi do. He loved being able to like have a community. He couldn't believe it. Somewhere in the middle of the service, everything stopped, and he saw that there was an offering plate he didn't know what it was. He just saw a plate that was being passed from person to person. And so he asked his neighbor, what is that? And she said, oh, that's an offering plate. He says, well, what's an offering? And she said, well, it's whatever you have to give to God as a thank you, you give it to him. The little boy smiled and waited patiently until the offering plate got to him. And so when it arrived where he was at, he grabbed the plate, he put it on the ground, and he stepped on it. Isn't that beautiful? He gave all that he had himself. He had no idea. Well, this station is 100% gifted by you, the viewers. Everything that happens here, 24-7, it's because you make it happen. And so just, this is a short reminder, please don't stop, continue to give support. There are three ways you can do it. You can pick up the phone and call. The number is on your screen, 866-552-6881. You can mail us a check, the address is on the screen, or you can go online and you'll see there, donate, click donate, but continue to give us your love offerings is what makes this possible. You might feel like, I don't really have a lot to give. Maybe all you gift is one hour, but who knows what that hour happens, who it goes to. So like the little boy, we invite you, grab that offering plate, step right in it, and continue to give us the love offerings. We are always grateful. Thank you. Well, happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I'm so glad you're here with us tonight. I wanted to share a story with you from my own childhood. When I was a little girl, I was on summer vacation with my grandparents at their house in a small village in Romania. And my grandpa loved fish. In fact, he had a pond in the very back of our house and he had lots of different kinds of fish there. And I was told of some rules. I was never allowed to go near the fish by myself because the water is very deep. I was never allowed to throw anything in the pond and I wasn't supposed to bother the fish. Well, one morning I woke up very early uh, before anybody else and I was so excited. I wanted to go and play and explore by myself. And then I got a great idea. I was going to prepare breakfast for my grandparents. I was going to get some fresh fish. Well, I grabbed my grandpa's fishing pole and his bucket that he always brought the fish back in and I started walking towards the pond. Oh, the excitement was just going through my body. I thought, I'm going to see this amazing look on my, grandma, on my grandpa's face. I'm going to walk there with the catch of the day, triumphant, just like a grown-up. 
Well, I sat down and I cast my fishing rod and my line in, and it wasn't even a minute. And immediately I started to feel the fishing pole rattling and I knew I had caught something. So I started to gently reel it in. And sure enough, I had caught a big fish. I couldn't believe how skilled I was. I was so good at this. So I put it in the bucket, but as I was trying to get it off the hook, it was really, really hard. I guess I hadn't paid much attention to that part of how grandpa did it. And so along with the hook also came, sadly, part of the fish's lip. Well, I was sad for a moment, but then I thought, at least I caught a fish. That's victory right there. So I put it quickly in the bucket and I started walking back towards the house. And halfway through, my grandpa met me on the way and I just stuck out proudly the bucket in front and I said, look what I caught. And I did see a different kind of look on my grandpa's face. But it was an excitement or delight. It was disappointment and sadness. You see, what I thought was going to be this offering, this special sacrifice I made for them was actually deeply evidence of my own disobedience. I had disobeyed all the rules grandpa had for me about that fish pond. This made me think of a story in the Bible. Do you remember King Saul? King Saul was the first king of Israel. And towards the end of his reign, his pride had kept him away from God's favor. Well, Samuel, the prophet, went and told King Saul, I have a message for you from God. He said, go attack the Amalekites, destroy everything. This is my punishment for them. Don't take any plunder, destroy everything. Well, Saul did that. He attacked the Amalekites. God gave him victory, but he did not obey God exactly. He took the king of the Amalekites captive alive. He took plunder and the big, fattest, healthiest animals. And he went to the top of Mount Carmel and built a monument for himself. He disobeyed God. When Samuel came to confront him, Saul tried to make up excuses and say, oh, it was somebody else. All the soldiers brought him there. Well, I'm going to give this as an offering to God. Shouldn't God be pleased? And Samuel said, no, God is not pleased because obedience is better than sacrifice. So boys and girls, when you obey God, you are showing God you love him. Obedience is better than sacrifice. What a blessing. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. I would like you to follow again with me. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. And it reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers, or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. Fail to 
what this week looks like, but I hope those words comforted your spirit and you are, you're listening to the words as they speak to you. He is able. Whatever it is that you're carrying with you as the Sabbath hours enter, if you're listening to us live and you're getting this as a Sabbath, or whether you're listening to us later on and you're picking this up, I hope the words of this song feed your spirit and you are able to remember, yes, he is able. And I'm talking all about Jesus today. I hope you're all right with that. I hope you understand that this is what this program is about. It's about making sure that we are continually showing and reflecting to you the life and the goodness of Jesus. Have you heard the modern hymn, In Christ Alone? It was written in 2001 by Getty and Townend. And the words go like this, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. What fears, when fears are stilled, when striving sees my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. 
Let me see if I can, I think this is stuck. I'll have them in the back be able to move it for us. In Christ alone. This is when I began to think about what I wanted to share with you tonight. I wanted to talk about Jesus. I wanted to talk about this Christ, this Jesus. Do you know that the word Christ is actually a title for Jesus, right? Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, which is the word that is used in the Old Testament to predict and to talk about the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah, which is and now in the New Testament called Christ. Christ. Southeastern California Conference is starting this year with a theme, connecting to Christ, connecting through Christ. And actually, the Southeastern is the conference that I serve and that I work in and live in. And it got me to start thinking about how do we do this connecting, connecting through Christ? What does that mean to connect through Christ? And when we are connecting through Christ, what are we connecting to and why through Christ? And so I thought I, I, I picked looked at a lot of Bible verses that I wanted to think through with you tonight as we entered into those kinds of questions and as we walked around and kind of looked at ways in which we could understand what this connecting would be like. So let me clarify a couple of things. When we think in Christ alone, when we think about connecting through Christ, connecting would be, an, a New Testament word that's used often would be reconciled. We are connected, we are reconciled through Christ. Reconciled means that we are restored, we are made new, we are reconnected, we are reconciled, Paul will say, through Christ. Through Christ. So when we are reconciled and connected through Christ, we, the earth creatures, right, because that's why we need connecting, our story begins in Genesis, and it begins in Genesis with us fully connected to God. We are made in his image. We work, we are, we are full, his fullness is in us. We are able to create like he creates. But in chapter 3, the story quickly turns, and now that connection is broken, and now we need to be reconnected. We need to be reconciled. Those are the words that Paul is trying to use. Be reconciled through Christ. And so what does Christ connect us to? What does he connect us to? Well, first and foremost, Christ connects us back to God. He connects us back to the original intent of us, these humans, these earth creatures, being connected back to its creator, to God. When we are connected to God, then something amazing happens. We begin to understand ourselves. We fully now can connect with ourselves. Christ connects us to God, and God connects us to our truest identity, our self. Oftentimes, we live in a culture where everyone is seeking to find an identity. We talk about identity politics a lot, right? I, I am a mother, I am a wife, I'm an administrator, I'm a minister, I'm a teacher, right? These are all these titles of what I am. Are those things my identity? Well, some would say, yes, those are your identity. I would answer my truest identity is that I am a child of God. Out of that identity, now I'm a mother, from that identity of being a child of God, now I know how to be a wife. Now I know how to be an administrator because my identity in Christ, he's connected me back to God and in connecting me with God, he now shows me who I truly am. I now know and I'm connected to my truest self. We live in a world where everyone is trying to find themselves. And I often say to the young adults that I serve, to find yourself, you must first find your creator. In finding your creator, you will find your truest and most meaningful self. And the third thing that he connects us with is to others. The Bible will use the word neighbor, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor, others, as you love yourself. 
It is only when I am connected to God and I am connected to my truest identity, I'm not shaken off by someone else's identity, that I can now be connected to my neighbor, to the, to the other, whether they believe the same as I do or whether they believe differently. Connected. We're connected through Christ. So the question comes, why Christ? Right? We live in a world of polyreligions. There are many religions. Why does it have to be Christ? Why does it have to be Jesus? Here comes Paul and the text that we read today in Colossians. Paul is trying to answer that same question, and it's being asked thousands of years ago. He writes it around 60 to 61. He's in Rome in prison, and he's writing to Colossae, and he's writing to the people in Colossae, and they are asking the same question. What does it have to be? Jesus. Who is this Christ? Who is this Messiah? Why does it have to be him? And then Paul pens the letter to Colossus in, the, in, the, in Colossians. If you haven't read the book of Colossians, I am telling you, I wanted to read you the entire book. It was hard for me to find a text. I kept on finding one and then moved to another one. It's all really good. This Sabbath, if you have time or if you have time in the coming Sabbath, grab the book of Colossians and just pick it up. It's a short letter that Paul writes. But I'm going to read to you chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And I'm trying to answer the question, why does it have to be through Jesus? Why the reconciliation have to be through Jesus? Why couldn't it be in some other way? Paul writes, verse 15, he, talking about the Christ Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. Why Jesus? Because Jesus is the image of God. Jesus shows us who God is. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. By him, all things were created, both in heaven and on earth. Not just this little planet Earth that we think is the greatest thing on Earth, but the entire universe is created by this Christ, by this Messiah, by this Jesus who chose to reconcile us back to the Father, back to ourselves, and back to each other. For by him all things were created both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him. Friends, we often talk about Jesus. N.T. Wright says, you know, we live in a society in a post in a, in a postmodern, very individualistic society that for them, Jesus is like, it's just this really good guy. He's like a social worker that like does really nice things, you know. They don't understand that Jesus is also the Son of God, the all-powerful and almighty, that Jesus actually represents. And this is what N.T. says. N.T. Wright says, listen, when you have Jesus in such a small little vessel, right, when your Christ is so small, he is powerless. But not only is he powerless, he says when your Christ is that small, you misunderstand what he represents Jesus also represents the faithfulness of God. He is a fulfilled promise. He, he represents the invisible God who promised to his people from Genesis, I will come, I will be with you, I will send you a Messiah. Jesus represents fulfillment. He represents the faithfulness of God. God has been faithful. God made a promise and God made a way. And then Jesus represents, and this is interesting. I had not heard this term being used, but he says, Jesus who reconciles God's people defeats all the powers of the board, of the world, the universe who rules and the whole kingdom that is among us. Jesus also defeats any power, whether here or above, any power. He represents the fullness of God. I continue in Paul. Paul says, he is before all things and in, in him all things. Verse 17, if you're following me in your Bibles. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. He's also the head of the body of the church. 
Friends, let me pause here for a second. Because oftentimes we, the body, we, those of us that are the church, we forget that he is the head of the church. We're the body. We represent his will. We represent his desires. We represent his ways. He's the head of the church, Paul says. And he's the beginning and the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. I'm almost ending here. Verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The disciples asked him, Show us who the Father is. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Christ represents the fullness, the fullness of the Father. If you've ever wanted to know what is God like, then pick up the Bible. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What is God like? Look at him in the life of Jesus. What does God love? Look what Jesus loves. What does God do? Look how Jesus lives in Christ alone. Okay, so I've given you the theological background. Let's spend a few minutes in some practical ways and practical applications. I live among young adult and youth and youth ministry, and so oftentimes when I get into the theological, they'll say, but what is that to do with me? Let me answer that. What does it look like to live a life that is connected and recognizes that I need to connect through Jesus? What does that look like in my everyday life? I will tell you there are three main ways in which I make it a practice or a rhythm of connecting through Jesus. The first is obviously the word, right? I need to make sure that if I'm going to connect through Jesus, I must know Jesus and I must enter into the word with him and to understand because what is Jesus always revealing but the Father? So if I want to know the Father, then I must be connected through Jesus. So the word, prayer, that's critical for me, my time alone with God There are a variety of different prayers, whether it's confession prayer or adoration prayer or thanksgiving or prayers of supplication where I sit alone with God and I'm praying on behalf of someone or on behalf of a community. Prayer. And then lastly, for me, it's community. I see and I connect with Jesus through my community of faith. Oftentimes, they're the ones who encourage me. They're the ones who give me a word that I'm trying to figure out. And God uses it through the Holy Spirit. He uses the community. So those are the ways in which I connect. But let's look at practical applications for me. So when I began this journey with Jesus, for me, I began by actually picking up the Bible as a young adult and reading it for myself. And I picked it up and I began to read it for myself. I had heard the stories, I knew the stories, but I knew that I needed to make a decision. And so I began to read it and I fell in love with the Jesus. I fell in love with what I was reading. I I began to understand it was like scales were being removed what was happening. And that led me and my husband to an adventure. So my first walk with Jesus was an adventure. It was a, we ended up selling everything, buying an RV, going across the country. We preached Jesus everywhere, all the different states. It was an incredible adventure where I got to see God. I got to see miracles. I got to talk about Jesus. When I returned from that adventure, I was changed. My identity had been changed. I realized that when I left, I had kind of, I had my parents' faith. I had my family's faith. When I returned, my identity was, I am God's beloved child and God has a purpose and God has a purpose for everyone. And I began to preach and talk and it was a beautiful experience. And life continued and as life often does, so with it came loss came tragedy. It came through years. It was 10 to 15 years of incredible suffering. Things were unraveling at every part of my life, and I was trying to figure out, what do I do with Jesus now? I know how to have an adventure with Jesus. I know that I'm fully defined in Jesus, but what do I do with Jesus 
When I'm in the middle of crisis, well, I held on. I held on and I, and I would look at how he handled it and God would put me back into the word and the Holy Spirit would guide me and losses, I began to understand how to walk through losses, recognizing that God's presence was with me even when everything around me seemed to be falling apart. It, it actually felt like the disciples in that sea where there's a huge storm and, and I kept on thinking, where is Jesus? And he's like, I'm right here. I'm in the boat with you. And I had to learn new skills. I learned new skills of trust with God. I learned new timing. God began to show me his timing. Japanese theologian talked about how we serve a God who walks a three mile an hour God. I began to learn to walk with God into meetings, to walk with God into funerals, to walk with God into sadness. And I would walk, I wouldn't go ahead, I wouldn't try to figure out the ending, I would just walk every day, and the daily manna of that day he would provide. And slowly, I just heard a podcast, uh, and they called this season wintering, which I loved. It felt like winter, and you know how in winter the the leaves fall and everything looks like it's dead, but inside all the nutrients are being? During that time, God was beginning to grow in me a new faith, a new ability to hold on, a new knowledge of how to respond when things didn't go my way. Timing, loss, and the last thing that he taught me was this deep sense of surrender. All of this I saw in the life of Jesus. I would run to the life of Jesus. When I couldn't, when there were moments when there was nothing that I could do, I would look at the life of Jesus and I would say, help me understand, and he would help me understand. Surrender was part of what he did. He came to die. The disciples wanted him to be a great rabbi. They never expected him to be crucified. He came to die. He surrendered. He was the fullness of God was in him, all the power of the universe, and yet his call was to go and to die and surrendering. What did that look like for me in my everyday life? Well, I'm an administrator, and I'll tell you in very practical ways it looked like I had been taught and all the skills that I had been given, I had been taking classes and courses and workshops on EQ, on IQ, on talents, on ways to go ahead, on strategy, on leadership. What that meant for me is that I began to walk into all those meetings, and what I walked with was Jesus. I began to walk, I began to have to wake up earlier in the morning, 4, 4.30, because I would enter into really difficult meetings, and Jesus was asking me, I don't want you to walk with strategy. I don't want you to try to figure out how to defeat all the ones that are around the table. I need you to enter and walk with me, and allow my will and my insight to feed you what's happening. And that would require deep surrender, oftentimes silence, and listening to God, and making sure that my love for the other was never compromised. Surrender. Do you know at the end what it ended up being? He was teaching me how to trust. I often say that we talk about Adam and Eve and disobedience, but technically, they just didn't trust God. They just didn't trust him. He he wasn't enough. And Jesus was teaching me, I am enough in Christ alone. I am enough. I can do the everyday with you. I can do hard things with you. It isn't about what you're going to do. It's about who you're becoming. It's the becoming that I want to be part of. Because the becoming is you are becoming someone who fully Trust is me. I am God. I've defeated evil. I know I've been faithful. I can do this with you. In Christ alone. I shared this story with you once before, but honestly, when I was thinking of how I can visually share with you, I, I couldn't think of another story. So I'm going to share it one more time. I saw this played out. 
In in one of those moments in my life when I had been praying for a particular thing and what he was asking me was to trust, I saw this. I was at an airport. I was in, I think it was Dallas, I don't remember. It was a super busy airport. There was tons of people. And what caught my attention was these two gentlemen, tall, maybe 6'3", 6'4", older gentleman, a younger gentleman, obviously a father and a son. And what caught my attention was the way that they were moving through the airport. They were moving like they were one. Their cadence was beautiful. It was like a dance through the airport. And so I was trying to catch and like kind of get a glimpse, like how are they moving? I could see like this kind of movement. And when I caught a glimpse, I realized what was happening. The son is blind. The son had his hand on the father. But the father and the son had done this for so many years that their steps were exactly the same. Their cadence was the same. They moved the same. They moved to the right. They stopped. They got on the stair. It was everything was exactly the same. It was beautiful all throughout until they got to baggage claim. When they got to baggage claim, I saw the father turn to the son and whisper something. And then the son just stood and put his hand down. And then the father went to the baggage claim to get the bags. But the baggage claim hadn't come yet. You know, sometimes in the airport, it was a good 10 minutes before the bags came in. The entire time, the son just stood still. He didn't move. He wasn't nervous. He just stood there, waiting. I'm telling you, I began to cry. I'm sitting in the baggage claim, and I'm crying. The dad gets the bags, grabs all of the bags. He has a handful. He fixes it, fixes it all up. He comes in, and he stands right in front of the son. He puts a bag next to the son, a bag next to the other. The son puts his hands on the dad. They grab the bags and they moved out in the same cadence. And I was left there, and I saw it. It was a visual reminder. Yami, this is you and I. This is what I ask of you. When I say in Christ alone, when I say Jesus is enough, when I say you want to be connected to your truest self, to God, Jesus is the one, this is it. But you must trust me with the little things and with the big things. Friends, I know that I say this tonight, and there are some of you that this is an easy thing to do. You're like, that's right, I can trust. I also know I am currently experiencing it through my cousin. There are some of you who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and this is not an easy thing to trust. It's not an easy thing to understand what is happening. All that I want to say to you is that his presence is enough. It might not be enough when you look ahead and you see, but it's enough right now. And if you can get into the cadence with the Father, where you're just walking day by day, receiving the daily manna that he has for you, your prayers for your child, your prayers for your adult child, your prayers for your home, your prayers for your marriage, your prayers. The work that God wants to do is a work inside of you. It's your becoming that he's working through. Is Christ alone enough? Yes, Christ alone is enough. And the life of Jesus shows you visually how that can be. As we sing this last song, I don't know how the Holy Spirit is asking or calling you. I don't know how this is being translated to you at this moment. I just know that he's there with you. And I know that these words, he can make them your words. So as you're listening to this song, would you use it as a moment to just open your hands and say to the Holy Spirit, say to God, say to Jesus, this divine trinity of love, I will trust you. I will trust you. You are enough. You're enough. Look for us, Lord. 
Worthy is the Lamb. So I'm going to end with a prayer. Before I do, just deep gratitude um, once again to all of you who are faithful viewers. Thank you to the volunteers who uh, I wish you could see how many individuals are behind the scene just putting this together, giving their love offering tonight. Just deep gratitude. But I want to pray for you tonight as I think about what I've asked of you, I know it's a big ask. I think we, we can often say, I can believe something and it's easy to believe it, but when I'm asked to live it, it's a whole different reality. And so I wanna pray over you tonight because I want the spirit to awaken in you the call that he's making you, in you, not just to believe something, I know that many of us believe that Jesus is enough. We believe he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. But the world needs us to actually live in a way in which we honor that reality. Live in a way in which we honor that he is the king of the universe, that he is all-powerful. And when the power isn't being used on my behalf, he is still God and he's still working in the world, even when I don't understand it. I don't lean into doubt, I lean into faithfulness. I don't lean into, I can't understand it, I lean into you are enough and I will trust you. So I want to pray that over your life. 
I want to pray that whatever God is awakening and asking in you, that you be receptive enough to release those things you're holding on to. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's fear that you release it and you trust God. Father, we are closing tonight recognizing that you are the darling of heaven, Jesus. You are the fullness of God. You are the king and the savior and yet our brother who came and who died and who has reconciled us. Father, we end tonight giving you permission to grow trust in us. Would you please, Father, grow in us that trust that we need to recognize that Christ and in Christ alone we stand. We thank you and we honor you. In your name we pray these things. Amen.